Welcome to the White Knuckle Podcast with your hosts, Jason Science and Dr. Clint McCoy. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the White Knuckle Podcast, episode number 136. Um, they're rolling by quick as uh, quick as the week, the year's going. Uh, it seems like they go by faster and faster every week. Tonight, I have um, at my side, Mr. Travis Homley, and uh, on the other end of the line, Mr. Don Higgins. Don, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you guys? Doing good. Doing, doing real good. well. Um, good deal. So I've got Travis with me, Don, because um, we kind of walked into, um, we'll call it a situation for right now, and one that I guess neither of us um, felt completely comfortable in trying to figure out. Um, I'll give you just a little bit of the backstory here. We sold a farm back uh, about this time last year, and it was a farm that was uh, really, um, or I guess, constructed um with whitetail hunting in mind ever ever since 1992 and uh the the gentleman was real big on qdm and and uh shooting does and all that good stuff and um because of health reasons he ended up selling it so um he sold it to trav's brother-in-law um as a result we got to know the folks in the neighborhood um just from from selling it um one of those folks um knows how much I like to hunt and they know how much Travis likes to hunt and just kind of out of the blue Trav was it yesterday or the day before uh Tuesday so the day before Tuesday um they offered um an adjoining piece which um for right now we're going to call it um 200 or excuse me 183 acres um that's going to border this other chunk that Trav's brother-in-law bought um and they they wanted us to 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 do a lease on it, um, but more important than the lease is they wanted it you know nothing under 150 um, or five years old shot. And then uh, the biggest concern was is that we take care of the food plots and make them better than they were. That's where you come in. <laughs> um, okay. So we know we're coming to the game a little bit late. In terms of in terms of the time of year, right? But we've had. I mean, yeah. the only advantage we have is we got a year of seeing what was going on in the area. I mean, that's the only advantage we have. Right, right. But but Don, we we are a little bit late. I mean, we don't have as many options, or do we? Well, it would have been a whole lot better if we'd had this discussion about 60 days ago, but uh, <laughs> you know, we'll, just, we'll just make the best of it um, for sure. Um, you know, you did share an aerial with me of the farm earlier, and, and I'm not a big fan of planning things out from aerials, uh, but I think we can throw some ideas out regarding food plots. Hopefully get you guys rolling. Okay. Um, so let me just really quickly um give you the the an idea of what the landscape is it's for this part of the country it's relatively rolling i'm gonna i'm not gonna call it um hill country but that particular part of 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 the state for whatever reason is is pretty rolling so there's some steep terrain the other thing that i'll tell you is um all of the food plots are on a relatively um level spot high uh, up in the air with the exception of one. Um, it's it's below sand, Don. There's just no two ways around it. Like um, it's Well, gonna... the other night when we were there and that storm came through, I thought it was raining and it was... It was sand. It was sand. So, so it's, that's what we're dealing with. So we got the deck stacked against us. Um, they're expecting us to kind of hit the ball out of the park with food plots. Um I don't know that that's possible, but we're going to give it our best shot. Um, I just thought that that would be a great opportunity to talk to you about what what your thoughts are. Okay. Well, I noticed there's some ag fields on the property, or what are those planted typically? All corn. Okay. 
And and have they already been planted this year? Yes. Yep, corn's about two, three inches tall. Okay. Well, is the, uh, I I guess the food plot locations are, are not up for discussion. They are where they are. Right, yeah, they, I mean, so this fella who owned the piece that Travis's brother-in-law bought um, was into heavy, in the in the landscaping and, and had a lot of heavy equipment. So he went in, in somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s and, and made these food plots um, and spots for these food plots. Otherwise, it was just, you know, scattered cedar trees on the sides of a hill basically and it was an old pasture is what it was yeah so. in in some of the parts and then in then then in the other part there yeah it was an old pasture okay um well i'm a firm believer in diversity in your food plots okay um i believe you need greens and grains and, and those grains could be broken down even further into uh you know, your annuals, um, your cereal grains, and then your brassicas, uh, as well as legumes and perennials, um, alfalfa and clover, for example. So, uh, I'm also a fan of um, fewer but bigger plots. Um, you want to have, I, I kind of use the analogy of comparing food plots to uh, restaurants for people. Mm. You know, a, a small food plot is like a fast food restaurant. It's like your McDonald's. So if you're hungry and you're driving by McDonald's, you may stop. But you're not going to take your wife out on Saturday night and drive 50 miles to McDonald's. So, you know, a, a small food plot just does not have the pulling power. If a deer is coming by anyway, he, he may stop and eat. But he's not going to come from a long distance to hit a small plot. Okay. Where that's where the bigger plots are really have the drawing power and the advantage. Uh, you can not only pull the deer on your property that one specific plot, but you can also pull the deer from your surrounding neighbors, and and that becomes their destination plot. Gotcha. Um, so I, I like a big plot that's in grains. Soybeans are my favorite by far, um, and then I like a. Uh, a blend, a fall planted blend, but you guys have plenty of time to plan this because uh, up there in Wisconsin where you're at, you're probably not going to need to plant until August. Right. Uh, probably not even until mid-August, or maybe early August, but uh, uh, Real World's Deadly Dozen is an example. You know, it's got 12 different plant species in it. It's got your cereal grains, Austrian winter peas, uh, and then your brassicas, turnips, radish, sugar beets, uh, kale, things like that. Uh, what I like about that blend is that from the time it comes up uh, until the next spring, there is always something in that mix that's at peak palatability. Uh, so the plants that the deer are eating when it first germinates are going to be totally different than the plants they're eating in December and January. Um, they, it just keeps them coming back to that same plot as as the uh, nitrate levels change in the different plants and the sugar levels, and, and you know they become different plants become palatable, uh, you can keep them coming to that same plot over a long period of time, and through the entire hunting season. Um, but but you also need those grains in there somewhere. Um, it's getting late enough now. I mean, you guys could still plant soybeans um, here for another couple weeks or so. I would try to get some of those in for sure. But, uh, you know, when the weather gets cold, uh, really cold in the winter, those soybeans will provide the uh, the protein and the fat content uh, that they're not, that the deer are not going to find in anything else available at that time of year. So, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you, you know, that's what I'm thinking as I hear your situation. Okay. So, we've got a couple of bigger food plots i guess um i guess let me just really quick um for you measure out the acreage on uh on the one um and and we travis and i had talked about it and we kind of decided probably to go with beans um 
but one of them is an acre and a half, which I know isn't real big. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's another one that is, <clears throat> I'm going to say it's close to two and a half acres. Um, nope, I'm wrong. One, uh, just, just about two acres. Um, there's another one. So it, what, what's that? Trend? And that sits on the top of a ridge. Right. Yep. That leads into some bigger timber. Yes. So, so it sounds like what you're saying, Don, is that, um, for, for those bigger ones, get some grains in it. Right. Um, smaller plots, it's just tough to get a soybean plot established without the deer just wiping it out as soon as it comes up. Well, and, and so, the, the, well, one, the one, grain plots, you can use the, the one thing that I didn't he mention... He bigger acreage. Okay, yeah. I, I, the one thing I didn't mention is the deer density is out of this world. <laughs> I mean, it it's... Uh, well, I, I guess I was headed over there one night to... Uh, on, on the piece that uh, we sold last year um, to put some turkeys to bed, and I counted 74 deer across the road in front of me into that timber, or some of the timber that... Uh, that um, Trav's brother, Chad, uh, brother-in-law, Chad owns. And, uh, so there's just a tremendous amount of deer. So one of my fears was, and I guess you can address it right here is, is we're going to, my guess is that we're going to plant these fields. Um, and because the beans are so highly, um, sought after, it seems like last year there was beans everywhere there. Of course, this year's it's corn, um, are, are, is it, we're, we're likely to run into a situation where they've just eaten through them. Yeah. Uh, if you're seeing that many deer for sure. But still, is there value in, in putting like one of the things I said to Trev, is there value in putting those beans there? Um, at least for the summer, maybe you catch something there in, in, in September and then do something like overseed deadly dozen. Yeah, I mean, you need something in there for the summer. I mean, otherwise, you're going to have a wheat patch. So right. I would put soybeans in probably all your plots uh, at this point and then come back in the in August and replant some of them. Okay. And maybe all of them. You know, if they all get wiped out, and there's no sense having a plot going into hunting season in the fall that doesn't have anything growing in it. Right. Right. So, so you're, it sounds like what you're saying is that, uh, and there are two plots that are, are, I'm going to call them established that I believe that by mowing it and, uh, running a harrow drag over it or something like that and broadcasting some, um, some of your chicory and clover that will, we can have a pretty solid stand of clover. Um, they're, they're hitting it hard now. Um, and it's grown up pretty good, but, um, I think we can augment it with some, some seeding over top possibly and those are just so you know small micro plots i guess you'd call them um and, mm-hmm. and on these these others um it, i think i think that's a solid plan um when we plant these beans um is there anything we should be planting with the beans like on a on a buffer any any um any ideas there in, in terms of making it more huntable? Well, I think at this time of the year, no, I would just plant them all in soybeans. Uh, you got a couple of issues. First of all is uh, herbicide. You know, when you go to spray those soybeans, anything that you would plant with it is going to get killed. But uh, uh, the other thing is like around the edges, um, it's, it's the wrong time of the year really to be, trying to establish like clover around the edge, which is a good idea. Don't get me wrong. It's just the wrong time of the year for the idea. Okay. Uh, going into fall would be a good time to do that, actually. To plant clover. And you know, what's that? To plant clover. Uh, as, right. As a buffer on the outside. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now, a lot of times on my soybean plots, uh, you know, the deer browse pressure is, uh, it's usually the worst around the edges of the plot. 
Um, so a lot of times I'll plant my soybeans in the spring, and then if that browse pressure is bad around the edge of the plot, I'll go in there in the late summer with a disc, and I'll just disc around the edge of the plot. I'll leave the soybeans in the middle, but they're on the edge where they've been browsed down. I'll just run that disc around the edge, and that will be planted into a fall plant like deadly does it. Mm, okay. I was just going to ask that, you know, other than clover, do you? And then uh, in the spring, you got the residual clover that comes up, and it uh, should be good to go. Yeah, and you can frost feed more clover into those areas, um, you know, in late winter, early spring, and then just just mow it, and uh, you'll end up with a, a good clover stand. So let me ask you, um, let me ask you this: Why, why is it that you're recommending beans? Just for for someone who might well, who might who might not understand why, I think I understand why, but I think I understand a lot of things, and I don't necessarily understand them. But. It's just been my experience that in the winter, especially the worse the weather gets, the colder and everything that the beans just stand out from even corn uh, and, and they'll eat corn. Don't get me wrong. They like it. But when it gets really cold, that, uh, the oil content of soybeans, you know, helps fuel those deer and keep them warm. Sure. And the protein levels in soybeans are just, you know, so many times higher than what they would find in corn. Uh, typically around 40% or so where corn is going to be about 8%. Okay. So, you know, you're looking at four to five times the protein content of soybean that's corn. Okay. That makes that makes complete sense. Um, have you had a lot of experience, and this just popped into my head, have you had a lot of uh, experience with uh, putting one of those solar electric fences up? I have never fenced a plot. Um, I've had a lot of plots wiped out that I probably should have fenced in, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I've never, I've never done that, so I have no experience to share with you on that topic. Okay, well, we're gonna try five acres this year. Okay, we're gonna try five acres. Well, so, we've got a lot of customers that do that and have great success. Um, I, I just personally have never went to the trouble to do it. I just make my plots bigger until I get them big enough that the deer don't wipe them out. It's kind of a luxury I have living in flatland, you know, where it's kind of easy for me to expand my plot. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, okay. So we're going to, we're going to operate under the, the, the pretense that we don't have the budget to buy five different electric fences for five different one and a half acre food plots. Um, and, so you think a solid plan then would be to go in there. Let's start tomorrow. Um, we're going to go in there and since it's full of, of um, probably winter wheat, I'm not sure what was planted in there. If anything was, um, we're going to hit it with roundup. Is that what we're going to likely do first to, to make sure we get in front of the weeds or isn't that a concern of yours? No, it, it's always a good idea to uh, knock those weeds back when you start. Um, Roundup typically will do it. If those weeds have uh, have a pretty good jump and, and got some good solid growth, uh, sometimes I'll mix some 2,4-D in there. It'll knock back those broad leaves okay. quicker and uh, better than just Roundup alone. Uh, 2,4-D won't work on any grasses or anything like that. So the combination of glyphosate and 2,4-D will take care of just about anything you have growing there. Okay. So do that. Um, till it up. Um, get it in the ground. Obviously, we, we haven't had the luxury of a soil sample there. We, have, we do have the luxury of a soil sample or many soil samples, probably 40 of them we took, wasn't it, Travis? Uh, enough, yeah across the street that we have a pretty good idea of what it needs. Um, is it too late to, to be liming the living daylights out of it and fertilizing the living daylights out of it? No, you just need to get that sample right away. It usually takes a few days for them to get the results. Okay. Um, but you can do that the day you plan, actually. 
Sure. Okay. Sure. And then, oh, and then put it on later. Gotcha. Well, you, you can, uh, when you disc the, I mean, so you go in and you spray, you kill all the vegetation. Um, you know, that's going to take a week or so. Uh, you do that right away and take your soil samples. And by the time you get your soil sample back, it should be time to disc up those plots. Well, you could spread your lime and fertilizer right ahead of the disking and disc it in mm-hmm. and then go ahead and plant. Okay. Okay. All right. On on the existing, we'll just go away from the beans for a second. On the existing small clover plots, um, is there value to throwing down some fertilizer and lime in those right now, or isn't is that going to be wasting our money? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I would get my soil samples. But the main thing with clover plots, everybody wants to spray, you know, either a herbicide to kill the grasses in or herbicide to kill the uh, broadleaf weeds that are in it the best thing that you can do for a clover pot is mow it um i mow mine about every 30 days mm-hmm. and mowing those weeds will really set them back but it actually stimulates that clover it's kind of like mowing your yard and you mow your yard you know two days later you can't even tell you mowed it but it makes it just stimulates that grass to grow well it does the same with clover sure. uh, if you'd mow those clover pots about every 30 days and then uh you know, I'd get a soil sample this fall, um, go in there and fertilize those. Maybe about the time you're planting your fall planted blends, you know, in August or so. Um, and typically what happens with clover, especially if you got sandy soil like you're describing, is it'll kind of go dormant in the summer when it, things heat up and, and get dry. Mm-hmm. Um, that clover, you almost think it's dead. And uh, just it turns brown and it's dormant and it's not growing. Mm-hmm. But then in the fall, when you start getting rain on it, it just comes back to life. And uh, if you put your fertilizer on there in August, uh, um, when it you start getting those fall rains, and it, that fertilizer will dissolve and those plants will just spring to life and be full of those nutrients and, and really be even more attractive to the deer. Okay. Interesting. Okay. I didn't, I, I've seen that before and just assumed it was dead and done, but it's, it, it'll come back then. Yeah. But the main thing with clover is mow it. Um, everybody wants to spray it. And, and there's a time when spraying is needed, especially if you start getting those cool season grasses in there. Mowing's not going to do anything to those. Um, but the weed type grasses, say foxtail or something like that, you know, mowing them is going to set that back. Mm-hmm. Um, but but you don't need to spray clover near what most people do. Just mow it. Yeah, I've honestly I've never sprayed clover. I've always been a fan of mowing it. It seems like um, the more I mow it, the more I need to mow it. So and that that's a that's a good thing. Um, right. But yeah, it seems like I I, I would agree with you a hundred percent. That's that seems like it's the the best medicine for for that, that type of plot. Um, another another thing that I wanted to ask you is. Um, does putting in all of these, you know, one and a half acre max, two acre food plots serve a lot of good, or are, are we're just going to be competing with the the larger ag fields? Well, typically, when I set up a property, I like to have those big destination plots, mm-hmm. um, and then the the smaller. You know, a lot of people call them kill plots or whatever. Those are needed too, but they, they need to be in specific locations where, you know, I, I use them, for example, to take a good stand site and make it a great stand site. I talk about that a lot. What what can you do to take a spot that's already a good spot for a stand and make it even better? And that's where the kill plot comes in. You know, a little bit of food right there uh, near that stand can make it even better than it already is. Okay. So, I mean, I, I describe those smaller pots as fast food restaurants, but, you know, any city that you go to, it doesn't have just big, you know, five-star restaurants. It's also got the fast food restaurants, a blend of both, and your property should have a blend of both as well. It's just the, the placement of those smaller plots it should be such that it's helping, and it's improving your hunting. If you had to describe uh, the placement of one of those, where would you like to see it? 
Well, uh, along a travel corridor that the deer are already using anyway, sure. but maybe it's a, a wider travel corridor where you sit in a stand, you can't really cover it all. You can use that plot to bring those deer up just a little closer to your stand where they're in range. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So, so you're wanting to stick it where they're already going and just give them a reason to stop or pull them in a little bit closer. Exactly. I don't use them to try to pull deer to a location where they're not typically wanting to travel anyway. Right. I just use it to enhance the travel corridor that they're already using. Okay. Assuming that we put up an electric fence and it, and it works, um, that would be a pretty darn good late season food source, obviously, and a great spot to hunt later in the year. Um, but we can also make it good, just as good, arguably, by planting something like deadly dozen should we not put the electric fence in, right? Right. Okay. And, and, that- and the other thing is you want to, when it comes to food plots, you want to look at what what's available to the deer in the neighborhood off of your property. So, you know, if you've got a neighbor that's uh, a poor farmer, he's always leaving his crops out until the middle of winter. And, you know, it's some years he's got soybeans out there, you know, till January, other years it's corn or whatever. You know, that's a food source for the deer. You don't want to be planting the same thing. You want to give them something that they can't find anywhere else in the neighborhood. So that when they develop a, a taste for that, particular plant species whatever it is the only place they can find it's on your property so you know i talk about uh when i'm consulting i tell my clients all the time you know think of your property as one square on a giant checkerboard uh, amongst all these other squares or properties we got to do everything we can to make your square different than all the ones around it and better than all the ones around it you know uh different food sources than anybody else has got That'll help, uh, you know, you, you have the most deer. Right. Gotcha. Um, any tips on what to plant? Um, cause we do have one plot that's about, um, I don't know, probably, uh, right or right around just over an acre, but it's in relatively, it's one of the, it's going to be the best soil that we plant in. Um, because it's it's closer to the the marsh um is there anything you'd recommend over anything else in planning and, and something that's susceptible i mean if we get a good rain it's going to get wet um and it's going to get it could get real wet um and it won't drain out for it, a couple of days before it right anything that you'd recommend for a place like that well, hands down, my two favorite plots are soybeans and deadly dozen. And what's another benefit of the deadly dozen mix is that with 12 different plant species in there, as conditions in a plot change, and you know, some plots will change from one side of the plot to the other. Um, different soil types or one, one side's wetter or whatever. There's going to be something in that mix of 12 plant species that's going to do good just about anywhere. So, you know, for example, uh, you may have six plants in the mix of the dozen that don't do real well there. Well, it still leaves you six that are doing very well there. Sure. So that, that's the beauty of that mix is that it's, it's adaptable to a wide range of conditions. Okay. Um, when we're talking about um hunting these plots when you're setting up your strategy and and i know that you're typically targeting one buck um we know that there's big deer in the area trev what was what was the shot in that area last year how many no not how many i mean what kind what class deer i think 170 was the no 180 was that's right, the 180 across Yeah, it's basically a lot of them are from the upper 40s to all the way up to 180. And there was at least 8 to 10 of them shot. Okay. So 
Don, one, one thing that I wanted to ask you, and I, I'm sure you've probably addressed it on your podcast, um, Chasing Giants, and, and that is how, how much of your strategy um, in killing a particular animal um, revolves around that food. I guess I, it, it'd probably be safe to say it depending on, uh, upon the time of year. Yeah, it does. Um, the strategy I'm using is what I just described. We're making my plots uh, or providing a food source in my plot that can't be found anywhere else and diversity. So, um, you know, as the weather changes and, and plants change in their palatability, the deer don't have to move off of my place to find something they like. Um, as the seasons change and their preferences change, well, I've got the next best thing there waiting on them. Um, you know, as far as uh, food plots and my hunting strategy, the biggest thing that the food plots do for me is they keep the, they keep my target buck on the property where I can hunt him. So I don't have to worry about him going all over the neighborhood to look at food. If I've got the best food in the area, I've got the does for sure, and I'm going to have him too. So the, the food, more than anything, holds him there on the property where I'm hunting. Got it. And, and Don, does that, um, if you took, does that strategy, you know, change in a heavily timbered area more than, you know, where you're located in more agricultural uh, with roll and, of course, you know, Wisconsin, the land of the, you know, the, the 40s and there's a lot more division in property owners, you know, mm -hmm changes the hunting pressure a little bit so does does that play a factor into some of these plots also and the the way to hunt them well it absolutely plays into the hunting strategy uh because we, you know the food is just one piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. and you know me diversifying and everything i'm trying to maximize you know that aspect of the hunt the other thing is uh, security. If you've got the best food in the area and you've also got the most secure bedding cover, then you should have some of the better bucks in the area on your crop. So they kind of work hand in hand. The other thing is you've got to look, you know, whenever I go to visit a client, um, I've got his address plugged into my GPS, so I know that I'm getting close. And the closer I get, the more attention I pay to what's going on around uh, on the neighboring properties and such. I want to see, you know, if, if if it's in an area of, say, like southern Iowa or Buffalo County, where there's food plots everywhere, you know, I want to know what the neighbor's doing because we want to do something different. Um, although the neighbor may be doing great things and we want to do some of the same things, but we want the property to be more secure, for one thing, and we want to offer different food sources and hopefully better food sources uh, at the same time. And, and, you know, um, I, I bring that back to Don when you visited my farm. Uh, you know, I talked to a few other people um, that had you out to their farm. And, you know, on their farm, you really focused on bedding and things like that. Um, so I was, you know, thinking you were going to be on the bedding phase. And the biggest thing I got out of it was our access points. The bedding yep. was there. It was the access and uh, disturbance of those bedding areas that we had to work on. Yeah, you know, if there was one number one key to managing a property for mature bucks above food, above anything, it's freedom of human intrusion. Human intrusion ruins more hunting property than anything. And, uh, you know, I, I'm on the internet and social media as much as anybody uh, watching the YouTube videos and such. I, I see these guys with all these different habitat improvement projects, whether it be uh, these water holes they're creating using plastic tubs or you know just one thing after another. You know, every one of those things creates human intrusion. You got to go in, you got to create it. Uh, most people are going in and they're putting a trail camera over it. Um, or they're maintaining it for those plastic 
ponds, for example. I mean, you got to go in and fill water. That human intrusion just kills more big buck opportunities than it does big bucks. It, uh, it, it, they're great tactics for seeing deer, seeing a lot of deer, seeing young and middle-aged bucks. But when it comes to the old mature bucks, human intrusion is an absolute killer. And that's probably, when I meet with a client, that's probably the hardest thing for, for me to get them to understand is just how much human intrusion kills a property. Hmm. So I, I guess to, to, to come full circle with that thought, you, you know, when I go into an area, I'm looking for the weakest link. And in your area, Travis, there was great bedding cover everywhere. Um, the food sources uh, were lacking a little bit, which we addressed. Uh, and then we tried to, you know, set up access points where the deer that were bedding on the, on the property, you can, you can access your stands without disturbing those deer. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's the weakest link and in your area. It happened to be food over cover because there was bedding cover everywhere. However, you know, mature bucks especially have a knack for picking up on the, the pockets of cover where there's the least amount of human intrusion. And it may be, you know, sometimes it's right behind somebody's house <laughs> or, you know, you get an elderly person, they've got a farmstead, but they don't go out much anymore. If they do, they hardly get past the yard. Well, shoot, they can have a giant buck living right behind their barn. And uh, if there's no, no human intrusion there, that's exactly what he wants. He doesn't care how close it is, uh, you know, to dwellings or something like that. But he doesn't want to smell that ground scent. He doesn't want to see people walking through the, the woods where he's staying or anything like that. Um, I mean, that's the key. If there, there is one key to killing big bucks, it's freedom of human intrusion. And then if you can use your food plots to enhance that. So he, he's got that undisturbed cover, and then at a short distance away, he's got the prime food in the whole area. Well, there's a good chance he's going to be spending a lot of his daylight hours right there and not wandering all over the countryside. So you you kind of you kind of struck a chord with I know with Travis. He was smiling, um, looking at me when you said, um, you know, uh, the biggest buck will be live could be living, you know, right next to a dwelling. Unfortunately, um, we had the good fortune of seeing this buck and filming him on Travis's farm um this summer through velvet and, and everything yeah and they had trail camera pictures of him and uh nobody could ever kill him um and travis and i were out uh, early this spring there's there's a little bit of snow on the ground yet and we just kind of walked uh, together from a different direction to meet one another and we met and there was a we i don't know what it was i'm gonna guess that it was in the 170s but the 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 crazy thing about it, Don, was that you could tell where he died is where he lived. There was it was filled with rubs, it was filled with beds. We don't know how he died, never will. Um, he didn't die real um, early in the in the bow season or the gun season. If anything, he was he died real late um, in the winter um, as a result of maybe some car injury or a bad hit or whatever the case may be. But where we found him, like we were literally looking down in the neighbor's backyard. I mean, well, yeah, in the neighbor's backyard, and then our farm. Like there was two houses within a hundred and fifty yards, and he had the food, corn right there. He had beans right across the road, all within a hundred yards of him. He had everything he needed, and he was on the one of the highest points. You couldn't get to him, right? So yep. that, that that just speaks to your point. Um, I lost my train of thought there as soon as I saw Travis smiling because I knew where he was going to go with that. But, um, you know, the, this property that we're, we're talking about tonight that I kind of sent you a map of, it, it's not going to, uh, it's, since it's old pasture, it's not been logged uh, properly. It probably needs to be logged. That's a, a conversation for another night, I guess. But, um, I, it's not going to hold a lot of deer. So the, I think there's value in having the food plots there because they're going to, they're going to, they're going to come there they're going to use it. And, and they're probably going to use that as a travel corridor. 
Um, how how big of a deal or does intrusion become less of a big deal in that situation than it would in bumping them out of their bed or, or anything like that? And I don't know if I'm making complete sense, but which I don't often, but um, is is it still as big of a deal or no? Well, human intrusion is a big deal everywhere, uh, more so in, in a bedding area. But, sure. uh, you know, one, you mentioned this is an old pasture. My favorite deer cover by far is an old grown up pasture, especially if there's still a little bit of grass, you know, in the ground. It's grown up in briars and tree saplings and such, but there's still a little bit of grass there on the ground. And for whatever reason, deer seem to like that. And, you know, especially here in Illinois where I'm at, if I can find an old grown up cattle pasture and hadn't had cattle in it for 10 or 15 or 20 years or whatever, that, that it just does not get any better than that. Well, you're, you just hit the yeah, nail on everybody the head. Wants to, There's plenty of really? green grass. Well, they like to bed in that grass. If, if there's some grass and briars and weeds and such, mm-hmm. I mean, that is the ticket. Everybody seems to want to go find the timber. And uh, I see it in the real estate, and you probably do too, uh, but uh, everybody wants timber on their property, and I don't even care about the timber. I'd rather have that growed up pasture. Now, it's nice if there's a scattered, a few scattered giant oak trees, uh, in that pasture and then the brush has grown up, you know, amongst those big oak trees. Yeah. But, sure. uh, that's the kind of cover. I mean, that it's not only good bedding cover, but that woody browse that's growing in there is good for the deer to browse on. They'll, they'll eat those blackberry briars and those uh, tree saplings that are growing up. That's just fantastic browse for them as well as cover. You know, part of, part of this, farm reminds me of that lower piece uh, uh i know you've been to todd's um where you know behind where he had his house there there was all those cedars yep um so this some of this country or some of this particular property reminds me of some of that um if that gives you any kind of frame of reference that there's a lot of cedars growing in sandy soil and and uh mm-hmm. now, now that you say it, it it does make whenever i go by i'm just um i'm surprised at the amount of deer out there because i always think well where in the world are they coming from because you're right you know we we get programmed to think that deer have to be in you know this huge blowdown that's impenetrable um by anything other than a deer and you know that's just not the case is it mm-hmm. No, you know, I've seen cedar thickets that are too thick, you know, that the deer no longer use them. And basically what's happened is those cedars have all grown together and there's no sunlight hitting the ground whatsoever. Uh, so the ground's just totally barren. There's nothing there for them to, to eat at all. But if you've got scattered cedars, you know, they can be fairly close together, but if there's still clumps of grass and other species of trees and brush and such growing up amongst them as well, then uh, that's fantastic cover. Okay. Well, and I was complete. I was completely wrong because I I probably would have been that guy. That not probably was. I I am that guy that would have said, "Well, I don't really think they're betting in here at all, so we don't really need to worry about this because this is an old pasture, and by and large, I can see through you know sixty percent of it pretty easily." Um, and what you're telling me is exactly it confirms what I saw. And that's all these deer, um, you know, relatively early coming out to these, what I'll call destination feed fields. Um, and it's probably because they are betting in there a lot more than I'm thinking. And that could be, that could be and a big mistake. The, the other good thing about a, a old pasture is that once it gets to the point, you know, it, at one point, there was cattle in there, and it was just, it was bare. It was nothing but grass that the cattle were eating and everything. And the cattle are gone, and that woody vegetation starts to slowly take over. Once it gets to the point where it becomes attractive to the deer, it just continues to get better and better and better for a long period of time, you know, 20 years. Before. And uh, that's exactly what my property was when I started. It was a cow pasture. I got rid of the cows and started turning them into deer habitat. 
you know, I helped Mother Nature a little, along a little bit with some tree plantings and such to, to speed up the process. But, you know, I'm a real estate agent, uh, just like you, Jason. And if, if I was looking for a property to purchase myself today, I'd be looking for an old cattle pasture. And, and for two reasons. One, it's the best cover. But the second thing is, is the price. You know, it's cheaper than timber ground. It's cheaper than farmland. It's like... Deer hunters don't recognize it as great habitat, but it absolutely is. Hmm. Okay. Didn't we just sell some pasture, Trev? Mm-hmm. Did deer hunters buy it? No, chicken farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Lost out on that one, Don. My, bo- yeah. my boss didn't have my I'm back. afraid I can't help you on that. <laughs> <laughs> They're big chickens. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't want to keep you forever here. Um, although I, I'd like to, you know, we're gonna take your advice. Um, we're gonna we're gonna plant some beans. Um, we're gonna fertilize those clover plots. Um, basically, do everything that we talked about, and then we'll you know maybe revisit this in August and see how bad they're pummeled, and uh, and then I think we know what we need to do from there, and that's plant deadly dozen. Um, which was, which was, as we all know, Todd's favorite product and uh, definitely my favorite product. Um, one question that I did want to ask you, and, and I'm just, I, I didn't really send you a complete map because I didn't have all the information when I sent it to you, um, which is why uh-huh. I, I didn't want to get too technical on any specific area on the map or anything like that. I just wanted to talk in a very broad sense. And um, as I count, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine food plots in, I'm going to say, roughly 170 acres. And of that 170 acres, I'm going to say that 60% or a little bit less, would you agree, is, mm. is cover or not in destination food plots or food sources Source. big farm i mean bigger farm fields is 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 that is that just simply too many food plots one two three four five six seven eight nine that's about th- that's about f- 300 acres or 300 acres oh yeah you're right it is 300 acres um is, is that is that too many options don when they're that small um, not necessarily, but I would have liked to have seen, uh, some bigger plots for sure. Okay. You know, in the, in the neighborhood where this property is, you know, there needs to be some plots that are over five acres minimum, five to 10 acres each. Well, we've, you know, that's, those are the kind of plots that, that just draw in your deer like a magnet. We, fortunately we do have one. It's, uh, it's it's on the property that uh, well we don't but Travis's brother in law does and we helped him. Uh, yeah, we uh, got five acres of five acres real of world real beans world beans in there, and, th- and that's going to get fenced off because they're already pounding the oh, living daylight. I mean, it's coming up great, but it's there's just too many deer in there. Mm-hmm. Um. So if you had if you had your pick, you. So there's a couple of these food plots as I'm looking at it. And, and next time when we do this, I'll give you a little bit more detailed map um, of, you know, where things are planted. But there's a couple of food plots that, you know, really are so close to one another. You know, one's completely clover. Um, and that's because the landowner has taken care of it because his walnut trees, I believe, are planted in there. So he just seeded it all with clover and and you know, put uh, plastic tubes around the, 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 the walnut trees and, um, and things like that. But it would be nice to combine some of these and make them instead of a one and a half acre plot. Pretty soon we've got three acres. If we extend that a little bit more, get, rid of, half, a few, four, yeah. get rid of a few cedar trees. You're, you're, it sounds like you're sort of saying that shooting for five is a good number in terms of five acres would be a, a good destination food plot. Yeah. And even bigger in some cases, especially the number of deer you got, but, uh, you know, a 10 acre plot wouldn't be out of line. 
No, I would I would agree with you. There's just it's it's I, I think we could shoot a hundred does. They, and, there was about fifty in the area shot last year. Yeah, and that wasn't enough. I mean, it's just it's just overrun with deer. So I think we're probably going to have to employ the use of that electric fence if it. If it's a if if it's a goal of ours to to shoot deer over that over the, over those plots in the late season, otherwise you can kind of accomplish the same thing, Don, can't you? With just planting that deadly dozen, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, For sure. So you're you're kind of having to do twice the work, but um, not a, not a huge deal. Um, you're giving them two different food sources for two different times, really, aren't you? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I'm okay. So how do you feel about, um, and this is sort of off the beaten path. Um, but how do you feel about in an area where I would say, and Travis, you can speak to this. Um, there's not a dairy farm anywhere close. So there's not an alfalfa field anywhere close. Whereas on my other lease, um, there's dairy farms and there's beef farms and, and there's alfalfa everywhere. So I don't have to necessarily worry too much about, uh, about planting that. But in this particular area that we're talking about tonight, there's very little green food sources. Um, knowing that would that, and I should have probably mentioned this earlier, would that change your strategy at all? Well, I, I love alfalfa. There's nothing more nutrient dense than alfalfa. The other thing an alfalfa field will do is it'll take a lot of pressure off of your other plots because it's just so nutrient dense and deer crave it. And uh, rather than eat, so if you had soybeans right next to the alfalfa, they'd prefer the alfalfa, um, you know, in the green browse stage. Okay. So uh, I would definitely try to be getting an alfalfa field on here. So, Don, that, that um, brings up a little, I would say, kind of test we're doing this year so this where we put the five acres of the beans there's actually it's a seven acre plot uh total that was cut out of the timber and uh, has been you know farmed and food plots last year on about two acres of it we had roundup ready uh, uh alfalfa in there and they it just wouldn't grow they wouldn't let it come up it just and it it, it started a little bit coming in this year but not much at all so what we did is we used that two acres we drilled some beans into it and we're going to kind of use that as our decoy plot from the stuff that's not fenced so we don't lose them but they still are intrigued with the um the beans and everything and we can spray it and it was roundup ready you know before uh with the alfalfa so hopefully that works and keeps them there keeps the pressure and them off of the the beans that we have fenced in but um you know we just couldn't grow an alfalfa crop either off of it last year so mm-hmm. but we'll see if that works i mean it was kind of an idea that we came in at the last second and thought of so right those bigger ag fields that are in corn this year, if one of those could be put in alfalfa, I think it'd do wonders for you. As far yeah. as taking some of the pressure off the plot. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine that the rent that they're getting out of those, you know, out of those fields um, is going to be, you know, too much for us to overcome. Um, if this becomes, we've got a five-year lease on the, on um a portion of it and at the end of the day i'm gonna i'm gonna speculate that we're gonna end up with a lot more um so that might be a a good a good possibility um it's not a real high traffic area so you know you don't have a lot of pressure from um you know people riding by and bugging the deer and stuff like that um because most every destination food field that's currently being farmed is you know is visible from the road um mm-hmm. um the, none of our food plots on the other hand are visible from the road so i guess that's a good thing um but yeah i think that's something to definitely uh definitely consider down the road 
um, is trying to get one of those into into alfalfa. Um, any any other final thoughts, Don? We've taken just about an hour of your time, and cool. I, I I know again. I just want to say that I, I appreciate you doing this because I know probably one of the things that you like to do least is not be able to see what you're dealing with, and and we didn't, yeah. and we just you know time didn't allow. Um, next year, you're right? If we end up with uh, what we think we're going to end up with, we'll be having uh, we'll be having Don up. Um, next year for sure, because we're gonna we're gonna need some help getting our hands around this. This is a big piece, and there's there's some quality there's some real quality animals there. Well, yeah, I mentioned earlier, and, and Travis knows this. I, I don't like to come to too many conclusions based on an aerial photo because. Yeah, I see an aerial photo of every property I can sold on, and then I, I see it before I ever get to the property, and I'll have these preconceived ideas in my head of what I think I'm going to do, and then I get there and put boots on the ground and totally change my mind about over 90% of the time because there's just too many things you can't see from an aerial. However, with that said, there is one spot on this aerial you sent me that just screams great stand side. I'm going to mark it and send it to you guys. Because if somebody, and you may already have, there may already be a stand where I'm going to point out, but if there's not, somebody needs to get a stand in this one spot. Can you just send it to me? Yeah, just send it to me, Don. Don't send it to Jason. (laughs) (laughs) Just send it to me, Don. Don't send it to Jason. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you are a client. (laughs) But uh, I printed out this aerial you sent me. Uh, so I could have it here to refer to as we're talking. And then I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm just, this place just screams, get a stand, big buck spot. There's got to be, I mean, if there was a place on this entire area to kill a good buck, this is it. So I'm going to I'm gonna point it out to you, and you guys can fight over who gets to hunt there. <laughs> <laughs> and there may already be a stand there. I, I don't have any idea, but uh, yeah, well, but I'll be anxious to hear your report at the end of the next season if what you might see there okay well we'll definitely uh, as long as it's okay with you we'll definitely um we're gonna do exactly what you said and and uh we'll we'll have a conversation again in august and see how it's going and and then um you know one 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 quick thing um that i wanted to ask um and then we'll sort of wrap this up in a nice bow is that you know, you talked about trail cameras and going in to check trail cameras and things like that. Where do you put your trail cameras when you're trying to pin down a deer before season? Uh, most of my, yeah, most of mine are out on the edges. All I want to know is that that deer's on the property. Um, if I know he's there, I pretty much, the properties I hunt, I've hunted them long enough now that I know exactly where to kill the bucks that are there. I just need to know he's there. And so I'll put them out on the field edges uh, where they're easy to get to. And I don't even care that I get his picture at night. That's fine. I, I just want to know he's there. Because a lot, of, a lot of times a buck, you know, they shift their range in the early fall about the time they shift velvet. Um, what I've seen in the ag country is that about 50% of the bucks, you know, they'll be in a bachelor group in the summer, and that bachelor group breaks up, and about 50% of those bucks in a any a given bachelor group are going to relocate for the fall. And, uh, so that means when they do that, you know, they're moving on to a property. And, and when they do that, it, it happens almost the same time every year down to the day mm-hmm. for a, for an individual buck. So if an individual buck shows up on, on a farm, say October 1st, and he's going to show up there about October 1st every year. And I'll use my cameras to confirm that, yep, he's there, he's back. And then I go in and start hunting. But I don't want to go in and leave scent and, and be spooking the resident deer and, and, you know, tipping them off the they're being hunted until the buck that I want to kill is there. I just assume stay away. Put zero pressure. It comes to back to human intrusion. Put zero pressure on that property until I know the buck that I want to kill is there. And those trail cameras being out on the edge is fine. It's a whole lot less intrusion than putting them into this. And there's some great spots, you know, usually in the interior of property where you could put them. But there's just, it requires so much human intrusion to get to them. 
I just assume back off on the edge, even if the pictures are nice and just know he's there. That's, that's good enough for you. I, I, that makes complete sense. I mean, there's, I, I think I employ basically the same, same method. The only thing that I do do is, is, um, probably sometime in the middle of July, I'll go and just stick a camera deep, whether it's in a bedding area or wherever once, and then I'll just leave it till I shed hunt and then grab it. And that worked out good this year. I got mm -hmm. a bunch of Intel and, and, and that worked out great, but you're, you're saying for stuff that you're going to use, um, you know, for Intel for this year, just keep it on the fringes and, and, uh, like you said, as long as you know, he's there, you're going to have to depend on your woodsmanship, uh, to kill him from there. Yeah. And you bring up a great point. I, I do also put some cameras on some properties in, into the interior of the cover and, and leave them there all season. Don't go back. I hesitate to recommend that to people because most people don't have the willpower not to go in at least once or twice to check it. And, uh, it takes a lot of discipline to have a camera in an area where you know you're getting big buck pictures and, and leave that camera there till February. And, and when you put it out in September mm -hmm. and you, you also got to trust that you, the brand of camera you're using, you know, you believe in it and you believe it's still going to be working when you go back in February. Yeah. So I, I don't mention that to a lot of people because I know most people don't have the discipline to stay away. Right, right. But, I mean, it was, you know, going in there and checking it um, is of, in my opinion, is of little value um, if you're going to check it on the 9th of November um, because what happened on the 30th and the 1st and the 2nd and the 3rd and the 4th and, and on from there is happened and, is already done and something has likely changed. Um, if you're going to do that, you know, if you're going to be pulling cards like that in the summer, you're going to deal with intrusion and they're going to, they're going to, they're smart enough to figure that out. They're just going to move around you. Um, so there's just, there's right. really, there's really not any value in checking those, those cameras. I, I, you know, it's cool to get big buck pictures, but the fact of the matter is, is if big buck pictures, um, equal big deer, then I'd have a wall full. Um, but I don't. Um, so it took me a long time to learn that, but, um, that's one of the things that, uh, that Todd taught me and, and, uh, um, was just adamant about, he's like, it just it doesn't matter. Um, it's kind of like you said, mm -hmm. you know, all they need to be is there. Now, you know, you can, you've got something to hunt. So, well, I, and I've developed a trail camera strategy that's different than most people. And, and I think most guys want to put their trail cameras out. And they want to get intelligence from those photos that they can immediately capitalize on. And what happens is they're always one step behind the buck. You know, they go out there and they check their camera and, well, three days last week he was here in daylight. Well, that doesn't mean he's going to be three days in daylight next week. They're a step behind. So what I do is I use that information whatever week, you know, he was there in daylight. That's the week I'm hunting next year at that spot. Exactly. So instead of, and I'm not a step behind, I'm a step ahead of him because I'm there waiting when he shows up instead of, you know, getting his picture and then, oh, well, he's here. Now I got to come in here and hunt. Well, you're too late. He's already gone. So instead of being a step behind, I try to be a step ahead of him. Right. And, and exactly. So, so you also subscribe to that same theory that they're going to do, they're on the average, they're likely to do what they did last year around the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that I wrote an article about that called same time, same place in 2003 that appeared in North American whitetail. And at that time I had never heard anybody talk about it before, but it's become pretty accepted that, that a buck is, is on an annual pattern, you know, where he's at the first week of October this year. Next year, he's, if he's still alive, he's going to be the same place the first week of October, and it goes right on through the season. Um, you know, once he's old enough to have established a home range, that's not going to work for the young buck. But uh, once they reach maturity and they've settled in on a home range, you can just pretty much mark it on the calendar where he's going to be each week. And uh, the trail cameras have made killing big deer almost easy. It's just there, there's a few... You know, I don't know if you'd call them tricks, but 
um, you know, things that you got to keep in mind. And, and that human intrusion is a big one. I mean, you can have a buck figured out and, and ruin it all with too much human intrusion. I, I, I couldn't agree more. That's, it's, I've seen it way too many times. Um, right. Let's, let's put it this way. I've, I've paid the dumb tax enough times to agree with you a hundred thousand percent or the price for continuing my education. I'll call it, I guess. Um, that, that's how I've learned everything. I made more mistakes than anybody out there, but I tried to learn from them and not repeat them too many times. Right. You know, and, um, Dan, Dan Infault uh, and I talked not too long ago, and um, you know one of the things that he always talks about is learning to love the failure in in hunting, and um, you know not that you have to love failing, but you have to love learning from that failure. Um, that's mm-hmm. super important because if you're not learning from it, then it's of no value. Um, you might as right. well take up golf or something. Um, and that's not a shot at any golfers, but, but anyway, Travis, do you have anything final you want to ask? Don, no, I think it's uh, I, I think it gives us kind of, uh, um, to some of the things we thought about, it gives us kind of, uh, an answer and, uh, gives us some ideas to play around with. I mean, obviously a new property is always, uh, you know, you got to work on it. You got to see what works and what doesn't work and, see where the deer come from, where they go, and uh, it's a learning process. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely going to be a learning process, and, and, and it'll be fun. Um, you know, I don't want to say they've put a lot of pressure on us by um, making a large part of, like, some of the the things that they want us to do is, is, is you know, have good food plots. So it's important that we get this right, right out of the gate because that'll – that'll help us down the road, um, which is why I texted you in, in a big hurry yesterday. I was standing right out in the middle of the field. I'm like, I'm going to text Don, and then I called you Dan, and I apologized for that. But um, I was in a hurry to try That's and right. figure, figure something out. I'm like, we got to get some help. And then I told Trav, I said, we can talk to Don tomorrow night. And he's like, great. So so let's uh, – let's we'll, we'll see if we can, uh, we can figure this out um, – for the time being, I think we're going to do exactly what you said and, and we'll report back sometime in, in August, see how bad they're eating. And uh, my guess is that we're likely going to be planning a whole lot of deadly dozen, but we'll see. Well, uh, that's my favorite Paul plant and blend. That and soybeans, if I had nothing else, like we said. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, as always, thanks. Um, why don't you just real quick tell us about anything new on either Chasing Giants, uh, your your consulting business, or real-world wildlife products? Well, I, I just started a new YouTube channel. Uh, just made it public uh, Monday, I guess. I saw that. So I'm going to be putting regular videos out, uh, as well as doing the Chasing Giants podcast couple times a month we'll get to more frequent as we get into hunting season and uh i'm looking forward to to this year and seeing what it brings awesome well thanks for taking the time and uh and we will uh we will report back in a few short months it'll be here before we know it yeah i'm always ready to talk to your hunting so uh don't hesitate <laughs> to get a hold of me <laughs> And uh, I think I've got three podcasts to do this week, and none of them are mine. So, um, <laughs> Perfect. I'll, I'll talk deer hunting every night if I get somebody to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, like I said, thanks again, and, thanks, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time hey, out welcome. of your evening. All right. Have a good night. Well, thanks. thanks for having me, guys. You bet. Yeah, take care. Well, there you have it, another episode of the White Knuckle Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show and hope you picked up a few nuggets of information along the way that you can use down the road. Uh, I want to take just a second and thank our partner in this endeavor, and that is UC Hunting Properties. Without them, this couldn't be possible. Um, You guys all know that I work with UC Hunting Properties, and they're actually nationwide. Um, I would encourage you for any of your property needs, go to www.uchuntingproperties.com. Thanks for listening. Jason out. 